not living walls. That's a little pet peeve of mine. Um, please don't call them living walls. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So we're not going to talk about benefits or research. We're just going to talk about the practical applications of living walls today. Um, a disclaimer first, green screens and facades are not living walls because their root zone is not vertical. Um, that's not to say that you can't get some of those benefits. You do. There are some research studies that measure green screens. There are actually a few studies that compare green screens to true living walls. Um, so we know that they don't offer the same level of benefits, but you do get some. But please don't call these living walls because they're not. Um, basics of construction. The best way I know to organize all of this is to first talk about kind of the three main options when you when you start looking at construction and then talk about um, everything after that. So regardless of the location of your wall, whether it's interior or exterior, there's three primary construction approaches. And that's true for um, all of the off-the-shelf marketers, G-Sky, Sage, they all have kind of the same basic characteristics. So there are modular soil-based systems, there are modular hydroponic systems, and there are fabric-based hydroponic systems. And I'll walk you through the basics of each of those, okay? So first we're going to talk about modular soil-based construction. Um, it is what it says. It's just some type of module that holds potting soil directly into the module, or sometimes it's a wall-mounted frame that holds pots that are full of soil. Um, but the key here is that those plants, the roots, are in potting soil in some way. Um, I've seen a few of these that allow you or require you to hand water. Most of them have some sort of irrigation. And if you look right here, you can see up on the left side of this wall, that's the irrigation line. And there's a single irrigation line for this living wall, which is normal. That's what you want. Um, but he's planting directly into these modules. So that's that. Well, I got stuck on the pin. Um, the irrigation can be dripper by hand. It's typically drip irrigation. Um, obviously, that's going to be a little bit easier. Uh, this can be a single drip line or multiple lines. And this is a warning. Um, and this is for any type of system. If you're looking at a manufacturer's design, and I'm going to try really hard today not to actually make any preferences known to you. You have to do your own research. If you want my opinion about any of the off-the-shelf systems, I can offer that. Email me. Um, but I don't want to get in the habit of um, endorsing any particular system or the other. But if there's any manufacturer whose system requires um, per module irrigation or more than one irrigation line across the whole entire vertical plane of the wall, you need to run in the other direction. Um, that's a huge maintenance issue. Water lines can get clogged, and you don't want to have to take the whole part of wall, uh, the whole wall apart. Um, the tallest wall we ever watered with a single drip line was over 60 feet tall. And so if anyone says marketing-wise, well, you can't get the water all the way down, that's just not true. So please don't go with multiple lines just for your benefit. Um, this is another one. This is at a trade show. You can see the arrow there is pointing. And this is what I'm talking about. Um, they have the irrigation split between these different modules. So there's an irrigation line there, and then there's an irrigation line there. And they connect with quick connects, which is not good or bad. That's fine because they're hidden by UV light. Um, but it's, man, it's a giant pain in the neck, and it's more time, and it's, it's more effort and money because time is money. Um, pros. This is more DIY or homeowner friendly. So if you're coming to us from a garden center or if you're more of a plant producer and you have a client who comes in that wants a living wall, you need to send them down this road. Um, this is more hobbyist friendly. Cons, um, because of that, they're typically not sturdy enough for commercial applications. They just don't hold up. The ones I've ever seen have always been rigid plastic. Um, they're just not going to hold up over time. They're heavier than hydroponic systems, 
because of the soil. When you have that much soil that's holding that much water hanging on the wall, your weight increases exponentially more than if you have a one inch layer of rock wool or a couple millimeters of capillary fabric. And so it gets very heavy. That also works against the sturdiness of the system. Um, and so I wouldn't do this for commercial applications. The potting soils don't lend themselves well to three-dimensional water flow. Um, and this is just, I've never seen a living wall in person that was a, a soil-based system that didn't have dry zones or plants that were showing decline. And it, it's water. Uh, water does not like to move three-dimensionally across potting soils as well as it does in rock wool or capillary fabric. And so you're kind of always fighting an uphill battle. Uh, despite a lack of the 3D water flow, those soil-based systems are um, very water intensive. They're not really environmentally friendly from a water use perspective. Um, that's just due to the or organic nature of the media. It holds a lot of water. Um, permanent wilting point in some of those natural soils is even a little bit higher water content um, than your capillary fabrics or rock wool. So you just always have more water. It makes them heavy, um, and it's just not good. Modular hydroponic, moving on to the next type. So various off-the-shelf products available. There are so many brand names out there that use um, a rock wool or a foam-based system, but it's basically, um, they're almost always modular, so they just fit together, the little squares fit together, um, and they either have rock wool or foam, and then they usually have some sort of an irrigation schematic with them. Um, for irrigation on the modular hydroponic, it's always drip. The water move, um, the water moves very well down and throughout and across that rock wall. Usually with these systems, each module is going to have its own irrigation line. Um, when we did exterior systems, we always used um, an off-the-shelf product from Sage, S-A-G-E. That was a rock wall system. Their modules are set up so that you have to have the um, irrigation running across each module. We weren't a fan of that, but we did like that they had a warranty and they warranted plant health as long as you followed their instructions. So we were willing to follow their instructions and use all of their irrigation as long as they would warranty our plant health. So here's what one of those systems looks like. There's a schematic on the left and there it is installed on the right. And you can see the modules, you can see that honey um, honeycomb framework of modules with your naked eye. Um, that is one drawback to these systems. There's an up close and you can see right here, if I can get my spotlight, there's the irrigation line right there. So where they pulled that module out, that irrigation line would have gone up and connected up there. So um, modular hydroponic, Pros, it's more suited for commercial applications, interior and exterior. The rock wool gives much better water distribution and 3D water flow than potting medias, which means you have a lower water use and fewer dry zones. And the big thing with living walls is water. That's your big challenge, is equal water distribution. Those plants want to grow. Plants don't want to die. So if you give them what they want, they're going to be okay. And water is the thing because you're having to make that water move evenly across a vertical plane. If you're doing an exterior living wall, one of these systems is my recommendation, um, and we'll talk about why a little bit later. Cons, um, if you have more than one irrigation line, it's high maintenance, especially in winter. We were based in Baltimore, and so we would have to winterize our exterior living wall irrigation lines. And you never wanted to drive past your wall in January and see a frozen waterfall coming from the middle of the wall because when you blew out the irrigation, it left a little bit behind. So that's kind of that extra maintenance we're talking about. The other thing is, as plants need replacing, and they will, when you pull those plants out, the roots bind to the rock wool, and you end up pulling some of the media out with the, with the plant. Um, and so you end up with holes and missing pockets of rock wool. And over time, especially if that happens up at the upper part of the wall too much, um, you can really affect your three-dimensional water flow, and then sometimes you have to go back in and kind of patch it with rock wool. Um, and that's just, you don't want to 
do that, but sometimes it's not avoidable. Uh, generally, it's difficult to get rid of the visual grid, and you can see what I mean here. And maybe I'm a perfectionist. Um, I don't like this because my eye goes to the lines of the grid instead of the lines in the design. And so that wasn't my favorite. Fabric-based hydroponic. Uh, this is what we did for all of our interior walls. And we had our own system and our own design. I'm allowed to tell you all of this. None of that was proprietary. Um, the only thing I'm not allowed to tell you is which capillary fabric we used. But I can show you everything that we did. And so that's what I'm going to do. Um, plants typically in a fabric-based system are planted directly into pockets of fabric. Um, you wash all the soil off of the roots. You only want the roots in contact with the fabric. Um, if you don't do that, you're opening yourself up to phytophthora problems because the water holding capacity of the fabric is the soil. And so if you put soil in there with the roots and the fabric, it stays so wet that the roots will rot. So that's, that's a big one there. If you're going to use fabric-based system, you have to take the soil off the roots. Um, the fabric is usually some thickness of capillary fabric. We started using dark colors instead of white because you could not see it through the canopy as well. We had three different thicknesses that we would use depending on um, how big our plants were and how much water we felt like we were going to need. Um, here's one of our fabric-based systems. Now tell me if you can figure out where those modules were because I don't think you can. It's one solid plane of vegetation. This is at the National Cancer Institutes in Rockville, Maryland. There's actually two of these walls on site. Um, they're just lovely. So these are two systems. We didn't use these, but these are um, commercially available systems. There's one on the left, and I actually do forget the manufacturer's name on that one. But you basically buy these panels, and the pockets are already made. Now. What a lot of these manufacturers do is they tell you to put the whole root ball in the fabric. Please don't do that. Your roots will rot. Um, the other thing that we ended up learning that we had to do is we had to take a staple gun and staple. We had to put three staples with each root ball, um, one on either side and one underneath it. So we, we created a really tight pocket around the root ball. The nature of that capillary fabric is the water likes to run down it, which is good because we got three-dimensional flow. But if we didn't force a tight contact around all three sides of that root ball, the water would stay in the back layer of fabric and not be pulled around to the front layer of fabric. So having staples pierce the front and back layer of fabric allowed water to travel and follow the staple around to the front of the root ball. And that's how we were actually able to make sure that each of our plants was getting well watered. If And we, we did pretty extensive experimentation. Um, if you just stick the plants in the pockets, they die from drought no matter how often you run the irrigation. This is another commercially available off-the-shelf system that comes with pre-made fabric pockets. This fabric is a little bit heavier, um, both in weight and density, uh, than what we used, but it works. You can see that drip irrigation line. There is a single line per panel for this manufacturer. Um, again, if you were going to use this, you would want to staple around the root ball really, really tightly. Um, pros, it's the lightest weight option due to the lack of soil and limited thickness. Um, suitable for commercial applications, quite obviously. You only need a single irrigation line. Fantastic water distribution. The fabric is more durable than rock wool or foam. As we had to do plant replacements, we just pulled the staples out, put a new plant in, and restapled it, and it was fine. Cons, it has to be truly soilless. So you do have a little bit of labor involved with taking the soil and beating the soil off of the roots of the plants. It's easy to overwater if you have too much soil in your pockets. Um, if you don't, then you're fine because the capillary action just keeps it moving down. Um, best for interior applications. I say this um, without ever having tested it. We were afraid to ever use this exterior um, in an exterior application. So it might would work, but we never had the guts to do it with a paying client. Um, take that as you will. You might want to try it yourself at home, but we weren't willing to warranty it because we just didn't know. Okay, 
irrigation schematics, um, wipe your brain of everything we've talked about because now we have to figure out how to get the water on the wall. Um, again, there's three main approaches, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about interior or exterior. These are your three options. You can have a closed or circulating system. You can have an open house to drain system. Or you can have a recirculating with a house to drain option. That third option is basically the first two combined. Um, for our interior systems, we always use one quarter inch drip tubing with built in emitters. They were half gallon per minute emitters. And we purchased six inch spacing and then we ran two lines offset so that we had a three inch spacing. That was our irrigation every single wall. It didn't matter if it was 60 feet tall or 8 feet tall. Um, the only thing we would then futz around with was, okay, do we want it running 15 seconds of every 15 minutes or do we want it running 45 seconds of every 15 minutes? But everything else was the same. Okay, closed irrigation system. So here's a schematic and this is just what it says, it's a closed system. There's a pump that moves water from the basin to the top of the wall where your irrigation line is located. Um, pretty easy. This is a DIY homeowner situation. Um, pros, you don't need to be plumbed into the building. So your wall can go anywhere if you want it on a patio, if you want it in your living room. It can go anywhere and you don't have to worry about where your water source is. Um, you have a lot more control over water quality. You can drop a pH or an EC meter down in there and see exactly where you're sitting. Um, other good thing, leaks are typically collected by the basin. So if you build it so that all of your irrigation parts fall within the boundary of your basin, the only time you're ever going to get water outside of that basin is if you blow the irrigation line at the top. And that's it. Cons. Uh, you must add water by hand, and that's that's kind of the thing, is you, you do have to add water by hand. We had a few clients, they were schools, they were smaller, um, that had these closed irrigation system walls, and uh, we would do monthly maintenance visits, but they just knew it was on them to add water every week, and so their maintenance person would add a bucket of water every Friday to their living wall, and it was just fine. The other con, once a year we like to leach out the media to keep salt buildup at bay and it's very difficult because you have to manually drain out the basin, clean it, put clean water in, leach it out, and then repeat that about three times. House to drain or open irrigation. House to drain refers to the flow of water. You are literally flowing from the house supply of the, of the building to the drain and you need to always have a drain. Um, I would say even in a closed system, if we can go back to the closed system, um, if you see this and you imagine your water line is kind of high, um, let's just say the power goes out, right? And so your pump stops running for a few hours. All of the water in your wall is going to drain into your basin, but it's not being sucked back up. So you're going to flood the front of your basin if you don't have a drain in there, and I speak from experience. So please, have a drain. Always have a drain so you have somewhere for the extra water to go. Um, very simple schematic here. You have your house water supply wherever it is. We usually try to locate ours either adjacent or behind our walls. Um, plumb directly into that. Use um, connectors to drop down to the quarter inch tubing size and then go from there. Now we did usually have some filters in place, um, but if you wanted to do just a straight uh, house to drain, this is what that would look like. Your basin at the bottom could either be a wet gutter, which means your drain would just be flat, or you could have a water holding basin, which means you would have some sort of a tube sticking out of your drain, and that tube height would determine your water level. Pros, you don't need a pump. House water is pressure enough. Um, you can use a wet gutter instead of a water-filled basin, so you avoid the chance for leaks. You also avoid having to worry about algal, algal growth. It's easy to flush the wall of salts. Cons, you have very little control over water quality and nutrients. 
The other thing we ran into, and we were going to do this um, with one of our Chicago Under Armour walls, and then we, we realized we couldn't do it. Um, because the city person with the city of Chicago said, you're not attaching an inline fertigator to my water pressure, to my water supply and then running it down the drain. Are you nuts? So that's how we came up with our third option. Um, oh, if water is shut off and it happens, there's no way to water the wall. And that's the other thing. And so our engineer at the time said, well, look, we need redundancy anyway. So we're just going to merge these two ideas into one and this is what we came up with and it, it was a phenomenal operation um, so we had a backup tank and we usually would put it in a closet or somewhere behind the wall wherever the architect told us we could go um, there was a pump in that tank and that's what was pumped up to the top of the wall so we had the house supply there but the house supply was actually our backup we preferred irrigating out of our tank because that's how we could control pH, nutrients, all of our water quality issues. The only time we used the house supply was when we were leaching the salts once a year to push everything out of the wall or if our pump broke. And, and we did have some pump losses and, and we monitored everything um, via the internet so I could log in and see if my pumps at my various job sites were working. If one of them wasn't working, push two buttons, you're on house water so the wall is getting watered while we order a replacement pump. Um, here's what that looks like and I'll, I'll walk you through this with my little pointy. So, uh, this yellow line is the waste line from our RO system, and this was back when we were still using RO water. This is, the RO system is in this cabinet over here, so the waste water created by the RO goes over here, and then that's, the drain is way over to the left. This blue line, um, this is our new clean RO water. This is a float valve. So what this did right here was if the water level got too low, the float valve would sink and it would send an electrical signal all the way to our, the RO system. The RO system would make water until the float valve floated high enough to turn it off. The house water supply was what was connected to the RO system. So we were using the RO. Um, our tank in this case was actually the basin itself. So instead of having a basin and a tank, we just used the basin. This is our recirculating pump that's pulling the water um, out of the wall, up behind it, and into the irrigation. So that's how that looks there. Okay. House to drain. Um, the recirculating with the house to drain. Um, pros, you can monitor and control the nutrient levels directly from the tank, and you can use your house water supply as a backup. And you can still use a wet gutter to avoid staining water, and it's very easy to flush the wall of salts. The cons, it requires a pump, and pumps do break, so it's one more thing to need to maintain. But because you have the redundancy of the house water supply, you don't have to worry about losing the wall. Okay, construction methods. Um, there's two options. You can plant in place or you can pre-grow your panels. I did both. I was lucky enough that when I started my past job, um, we were still planting in place. And then about three months after I started, we did our first pre-planted wall, um, pre-planted panel wall. So I've seen both. Um, so I feel pretty confident about this. Uh, regardless, please always be aware of safety for your employees and also those maintaining. Um, this is a lift with a ladder at an unsafe angle and there's about a 15 foot drop beneath our engineer who is on that ladder um, to a concrete floor. Um, so please, please keep safety in mind and, and always remember that. Okay, pre-installation. So if you're going to plant in place, this is how we did it. And we walked onto the job site and this is what we saw. We were usually the last subcontractor on a site, just a wall. Um, we would, at the time, we would wrap it in Tyvek home wrap, and we used one inch by four inch PVC boards um, to create a stud system. And PVC boards and four by eight PVC panels can be purchased at Lowe's and Home Depot. Uh, once we attached the four foot by eight foot um, PVC panels to our studs, 
We covered it with Grace Ice and Water Shield, also available at Home Depot and Lowe's. You buy that in the roofing section. We preferred Grace. It was pretty expensive, but Grace comes with its own insurance policy. They swear that you can't get a leak through their product because it's self-healing. So what that means is if a staple or a nail pierces that material, it kind of sucks back in around it, and water can't get back out um, past that nail. Now, we flooded lots of office buildings, and we, we flooded lots of buildings, but we never flooded behind a wall. So usually when we had issues, it was because of our own problem with our basin or our irrigation. Um, never the grace. We never flooded behind a wall. Then we would put two layers of our capillary fabric on. Um, the top layer, we would cut with slits to form pockets. So the back layer was just a solid layer. And then the front layer, we would just slit it open a couple of inches with a box cutter, tuck the root ball into that, and then staple it with an air compressor and a staple gun. Um, there's our basin and our circulating pump with the float switch. And this is what the planting process looks like. Um, it, it takes a while. This wall took about three people, three days on site to plant. We preferred three-inch pots of tropicals. We would use fours, but we liked the threes better. We felt they grew up better into the wall. And this is what it looked like at completion. Um, notice, notice we covered the basin um, with fake rocks because that, that basin served as our tank in this case. And so we had to keep algae from growing in it. And there was an open window, like an atrium skylight above this wall. Um, that was the wall for this wall. And so we had to block that so that we didn't get algal growth. Uh, this is a monitoring system. This is what we ended up using. So it looks really scary. Um, it's just internet connection and a Raspberry Pi that operated everything. And these were the pumps. And you can see here, this is where our fertigator pulled in. We had a separate tank with our fertigation solution. Um, that was set with our monitoring. So our monitoring told the system, OK, this is our pH that we want, and this is the EC that we want. And if we fell below our parameters, it would give us some fertilizer. Challenges of building a place, most of our labor was on site, and all of the materials had to be delivered there. Um, and that was a lot of labor and money. Uh, the timing of our plant deliveries left little flexibility. Our tropicals had to come from Florida. We were in Baltimore. If you've ever dealt with commercial construction, you know that a commercial construction general contractor can say, you need to be on the job site on Monday, and then he'll call you Sunday night and say, oh, we don't need you until next week. Well, if our plants have already been delivered, and at the time we didn't have any kind of a greenhouse or growing operation, that was a problem. It also meant that transplant shock was usually at the worst time possible. So because we were the last sub on the, on the site, um, the ribbon cuttings were usually within a few days after we finished, and that was when we would see most of our leaf drop from uh, transplant shock. So then we went on to, trans to the pre-planted panel method, and it's ironic that I'm showing you this wall because we're using Citrix Go to Meeting. This is the Citrix headquarters in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, at the time I left the company, this was the largest wall we had ever done. You see about half of it. Um, I, if I remember correctly, it was 70 feet long and two stories tall. It was about, one, two, three, it was 16 feet tall actually because it was four plant panels tall. Um, so this is a panel wall. Pros here, most of our labor was off-site and the on-site phase was much faster. It gave us very much more flexibility for our construction schedule. We controlled all of the plant transplant shock in our own facilities. Um, plants were more mature and full of installation. Really, the only cons for us were it required adequate growing facilities, and the plants were far more sensitive during transport. So here's that. So we have, you can see here, we have a four foot by four foot PVC panel here. It's been covered with fabric. And instead of cutting slits, we just layered strips of that fabric in a basket weave pattern to create the pockets. But we're still stapling them in. You have to have those staples around the root balls or you're not going to get good contact. Um, this is our growing facility. Now, this is not a greenhouse. We started in a greenhouse, and we still had transplant shock. 
So we decided to go to an indoor growing facility using artificial lights because that's what most of our walls ended up in. And we felt like if we could grow our panels in the same ambient office temperature environment that it was going to be in eventually anyway, we would manage our transplant shock better, and we did. So this is the on-site construction um, for our pre-planted. We just started with the plywood wall. They didn't even have to sheetrock it. We would go directly onto the plywood. This time we put the grace directly on the plywood. Grace is very sticky. It has an adhesive back, so once you stick it, it's not going to move, but it, that does mean it stays stuck to the plywood. Um, what the guys are doing here is the, there was an Under Armour logo that had to hang in the middle of this wall, and we had to have extra bracing supports, and so that's what they're working on right there. The panels are hung bottom to top, so we had to make sure we, we laid a laser, a laser level to have a laser leveled line <laughs> so that we knew that the bottom row was perfectly level. Once we had the bottom row hung and it was fine to go, we could get it hung in just about half an hour, two hours max, depending on the size of the wall. We used a cabinet cleat system. So if you know how cabinets are hung with cleats, that's what we used on the back side of our panels. We still screwed them in to the plywood, but technically the cleats held them there. Now we had to weave the edges of our hanging fabric. Um, if we left the edges hanging out forward, the water would travel down to that corner and drip out of the front of the wall instead of dripping down the back of the wall so that the plants below would actually um, start experiencing drought conditions. Um, so that was a little bit of labor, but it was still pretty fast. Um, and this is the day of completion, and I don't think your eyes can pick up where any of the panels are. We had a little bit of a planting error here in our design, but other than this one line, I never can tell where the panels are. Maintenance. This is the tall wall I was telling you about that was irrigated with a single line. There's me down there. Very tall wall. This is the Social Security Administration building in Baltimore, Maryland. Sometimes contracts are meaningless, and you have to know that. Um, our contract stated that we were required to have immediate access to all of our walls for maintenance. We couldn't get on this one for five months because the lift that we were originally supposed to use for maintenance wouldn't fit through the door. So they had to buy another lift, it was $90,000, just for us to be able to, which they also used it to change the light bulbs in the building, but um, they didn't have a lift in the building for five months, and we were just praying that nothing would happen, because the risk of irrigation clogs is always highest immediately following construction. That's when all of your lines are open, so if debris or dust is going to get in there and cause a clog, you're going to know pretty quick. Um, prune it regularly. We visited each wall every four to six weeks, and we always pruned about a third of the largest material from the canopy. Even if the wall did not look like it needed to be pruned, we would take about a third of the material with us, because if not, the plants would get leggy. They would start um, crowding each other out, and then you would get space between the green canopy and the fabric, um, and then any future pruning would leave holes, which is bad, so we had to stay on top of that. And so you can see here, it doesn't look like this wall needs to be pruned, but we're absolutely pruning it because we have to keep that tight against the, fall, uh, the wall. pH. Most of our plant palette was tropical because we were typically dealing with interior plants, so we kept our pH between 5.5 and 6.5. And and if we went too low, we added lime directly to the tanker basin. Um, our nitrogen source and our water-soluble fertilizer was ammonium sulfate because sulfate is acidifying. We never actually really had to deal with pHs that were too high. It was always too low. Electrical conductivity. So in our monitoring, it's very inexpensive to, to have um, EC meters or EC nodes built into the irrigation system. Um, so we use the rough relationship that 0.2 to 0.8 millisiemens was approximately equal to 150 to 550 parts per million. So we used an EC meter to kind of give us an acceptable range for our nutrients. If we started getting too high, we wouldn't fertigate for a few days. If we started getting too low, we would shoot it with the injector. 
Um, RO filtration would give us an EC of dead zero to start out with, but we moved away from RO and went to inline carbon block filtration. That would usually give us an EC of between 5 and 10, rarely zero, because carbon block filtration doesn't capture fluoride. When we first moved to carbon block filtration, we were concerned because city water supplies do typically add fluoride. Um, so we did a test wall first, and we thought, we're going to watch this for a while and see if we have any issues. We never had any issues, so we transitioned all of our walls to carbon block. RO is very water wasteful, and they're also very expensive to maintain those systems. Oh, hey, I just said all of that. Okay. EC and nutrients. Um, walls with natural light needed more nutrients than walls with artificial light, but we also use nutrients to manage growth. I didn't want my walls to grow too profusely because that meant more maintenance more often, and that was more money out of my budget. So I walked the line between hungry and deficient, and that, that was just what we did from a commercial standpoint of having to make money. If we had had the, the time in our budget and the money in our budget, we could have made them full, lush, tropical, needing to be pruned every couple of weeks, but we didn't want to do that. Once a year, we flushed each wall with water to leach any salts. Um, some of our diehard species didn't like certain walls. We usually would know six to eight weeks post-installation if we were going to have to replace anything, and we would do that on site at the very first maintenance visit. Um, and there's some examples listed. We used calathea a lot. We used a lot of bird's nest fern and a lot of creeping fig. But sometimes there were just microclimate issues, and we couldn't get them to grow, and so we would just replace them out. Um, philodendron was our go-to. Philodendron would, grow, would go anywhere. So if we had an issue, we would replace it with one of the different contrasting colors of philodendron so that it would still keep the integrity of the design. Um, the design didn't stay the same over time. So our contract would usually state that we guaranteed plant health and plant coverage but we did not guarantee the original design because some species would recede back, some species would become more dominant, and we were okay with that. We always had cuttings of philodendron apothos. If we saw something was starting to decline, we would root those cuttings directly into the fabric, and then by the time we came back to the next visit, it usually would have taken over whatever was failing. Um, I know I'm taking up a lot of time. Next thing, lighting, and this is it. Um, this was the worst part of my job, and this was the thing that I hated most, because when architects would come to us wanting our walls, they wanted to know what system we specified. And we specified the wall, but it was in our contract that they had to provide lighting, and it had to offer suitable plant growth characteristics, which meant photosynthetically active radiation. Unfortunately, interior architects and lighting engineers don't speak in PAR, they speak in Kelvin. Kelvin is the light color or light temperature. I don't know how many conference calls I sat on banging my head against a desk because I don't know how many PAR equals 5,000 K. And we figured out through trial and error that there is no direct relationship. So we speak PAR, they speak Kelvin. Um, there is there has to be some sort of a mathematical relationship. I never could figure it out. And the last time I looked, um, no one has figured it out yet. It would be a great dissertation project. Um, but I can give you some pointers in just a couple slides. LED is king now. And in our growing facility, we use T8 LED lamps. You can buy these at Lowe's and Home Depot. These fit into a traditional fluorescent ballast. So it was really inexpensive for us to light our growing facility because we just had cheapy fluorescent fixtures and then popped these $20 bulbs in them. So learn from my mistakes. Architects wanted to specify the fixture so that it would be pretty, and then they wanted me to specify the bulb, which they call the lamp. We never knew if the lights were going to work until they were installed on the job, and I held a PR, PAR meter on them, and I was wrong more than once. Do not buy in the daylight range. Even though you'll have plenty of PAR, the visible color to the human eye will be blue, and it will look like a Smurf disco. Don't do that. We did that at Under Armour headquarters, and it was awful. Um, we typically did not find uh, PAR below 2700K, so that was our cutoff. We did know that. 
that. But we also never found par usually um, between 3,500 and 4,000. It just kind of dropped off. We found reasonable at 3,000, but the visible effect for humans was it looked like a dimly lit room. Um, we typically would spec 4,000 to 4,500 K LED lights, but sometimes that still wasn't enough. It We learned it really just depended to, um, it seemed to depend on the manufacturer and the type of lamp. Um, so we, we literally just didn't know until we walked on the job site if we were going to have enough light. Um, and so now that I've taken up so much of your time, um, I can answer any questions that you might have. <laughs>